Hi, my name is Gar Lawrence and thanks for tuning into my podcast today. If you're enjoying these conversations and you want to check out more of this transformational work, be sure to come back to guylawrence.com.au and join me as we go further down the rabbit hole. Enjoy the show. Aaron, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Mate, we've gotten to know each other for a while now over the previous maybe three or four years. And uh, obviously, I've gotten to know what you do and everything, hence why I've, I've reached out to ask you to come on the show today. But like I ask all my guests right now, if strangers stopped you on the street and asked you what you did for a living, what would you say at this point? <laughs> well, at this point, I'm still a lawyer, but that's iffy, uh, you know. <laughs> um, uh, you know, with this COVID-19 stuff that we're experiencing now, uh, I'm not doing much lawyering. I'm actually at home uh, moving and meditating and breathing and being in my ice bath and being in nature and being with my children and my family. So at the moment, I'm just living. <laughs> <laughs> so living the dream, it sounds like, more than anything else. But, That's uh, it. Yeah, no, fantastic. Mate, I'm, I'm fascinated and I'm always fascinated by people's transitions in life. Like I think we all go through them at different stages in different areas. Uh, depending on our age and where we're at mentally, emotionally, physically. And, and um, you know, I, I remember meeting you for the first time at the Wim Hof retreat, which was, when was that? 2016, was it? Yeah, it was uh, four or five years ago now. It's been a while. Well, time flies, isn't it? And, uh, and I was like, who's this crazy handstand king? He just keeps wanting to do handstands in the middle of the room all the time in between breathwork <laughs> sessions. <laughs> and... You know, as I got to know you, you were like, you're a lawyer. I was like, huh, that's a really, uh, you know, I didn't expect that from, from you with you because you were so immersed in the movement side of things. I thought you were just literally living and breathing and teaching movement. So my first question to you is, can you share us a little bit about your transition? Because I know you've uh, been through many different difficulties in different areas of your life. And what started to lead you to look into modalities like Wim Hof and started to grasp and be so passionate about movement and the other things that you so openly share with now with people? Yeah, there's been a few key mystical moments. Um, I think you could, I, I, I can trace it to when the first was around 2003, I was uh, working in Brisbane as a lawyer in the city and just getting going as a young professional. I just bought my first house, got my first mortgage, I was uh, with a long-term partner and looking to settle down and, and get engaged and get married. And we just got our, a dog, you know, I just got a BMW <clears throat> and I was really starting to indoctrinate into the legal profession and, and get going as a young professional. And one night I was asleep and I had this incredible dream, which was, uh, almost nightmarish and in the dream I witnessed my long-term partner at the time in a car accident and when I witnessed the car accident the pain was so great that I had a heart attack in the dream and I died and I jetted off into death I guess you'd say and I left my body and I felt this bliss, this total peaceful bliss. And I was with no body. I had no visual output at all. It was just an awareness or an experience. And at the time I had no spiritual framework to use this at all. I, I didn't know what was happening and this was all in my dream, but it felt so real. And the moment I hit this space, uh, a presence, came to me and it was my deceased grandmother and she told me you're not you're not meant to be here what are you doing here type thing I, and there was no verbal there was no visual or anything it was just an awareness that oops I'm not supposed to be here and with that thought or with that message I I plummeted like a skydive back into my body and when I woke up I, I couldn't breathe for quite a while I was I was panning and um, I was very emotional and, and I didn't know what had happened. And I honestly felt like I had died and shit. <laughs> that wasn't quite the, the answer I was expected straight off the bat. It's amazing. So one thing I, that sprung to mind then, 
So when you say you felt out of body, was that out of body, you were dreaming that or did you actually feel out of body? It was one of those dreams that was so intense, it was real and I, I didn't feel my body anymore. It was the first time I couldn't feel my body, but I was just an awareness of me. And it was the first true experience I'd had where I was somewhere else outside of my body, still completely me. Um, in some sort of essence form. And there was no visual at all. It was, it was nothing visual about the experience. It was all just purely an awareness um, experience. And when I did come back into my body, I had all the physical symptoms of having held my breath for a long time or, or being unconscious or something. And, and it was frightening and it really freaked me out. I'm not surprised. My God. Yeah. You know, I've had experiences like that now from meditation. Yes. But that's of years of practice. Yes. <laughs> and preparing yourself. Like when something like that happens just out of the bat with, with no understanding what was going on. So what, what was the first thing you did? Did you, did you tell your fiance? Did you just... Yeah, I, I did. I, I told her about it. And to be honest, I just swept it under the rug. I mean, I, it, was, it changed the way I started to see things because um, it was... Uh, the first time I'd experienced being something other than just my body. So it was a, it got me interested in some of the mm -hmm. spiritual concepts. Uh, but I, I really just swept it under the rug and I just kept plowing on into my corporate life. And where it gets really weird is in 2010. So some seven or eight years later, my, I was still with the same partner. The accident happened. Uh, she was in the car accident and it did happen in real life uh, on the Bruce Highway um, just south of Coulomb on the Sunshine Coast. She was in a head-on collision and I was called by police. I was sitting having coffee and I was told there'd been an accident and, and you better get down here if you're nearby because it's not good. And I got down there and I this was the, the quickening or the reckoning of this moment where the two moments came together and I thought, oh my, oh my God, I've seen this. this. I've seen this before seven or eight years prior. And wow. thankfully she didn't die, but it was, it was very close. And I think just that synchronicity of those moments started to make me think there's something more going on here than just the, the physical, literal, visual uh, experience I'm having in my body um, because I, it just couldn't be a coincidence. This is too freaky. Um, so that one really started to lift the lid off my desire to explore uh, spirituality and meditation and breath work and all these other things because I got to feel that there's so much more going on. Wow. So, so that experience happened. You've accepted um, this was the point. To, to really start to look at that. So then what was the next thing you started to do? Because if I understand, there was, was there more resistance in your life in certain huge, areas? Huge resistance. And, you know, I could be given miracles like this and still not get the message. <laughs> and uh, so uh, we went through a, a difficult period, of course. Uh, there was a lot of rehab for her. And um, I was made redundant at the same time, two weeks after that accident. Oh, I lost wow. I lost my job and so we went from being a um, dual income uh, young professional couple to in a, in, a, in a predicament. So I started my business, the law firm from home, so I could be at home and uh, try to build something to bring us some financial security. So, and my goal was just to take care of us and make sure that we're okay. Uh, just the part. Exactly. And uh, so away we went. Um, the resistance came in the form of not coping very well with the extra stress I added in. And um, that led to some, some drinking, uh, some, some alcoholism to try and manage the stress and cope. And that just became my medicine because I didn't yet have any other practices that would uh, help me offset the stress or help me manage. So... Eventually, that got to be problematic. The alcohol catches up, of course. And how long was this going on for, do you think? Quite a few years. Uh, um, 
uh, a couple of years, uh, you know, I want to say three or four years where it, it got worse and worse for me. Um, as I initially, the alcohol worked fairly well, but then it, it just saturated me and it numbed me to the point where I couldn't really feel anything. So, um, that then led me to another kind of difficult moment where my relationship broke down. Um, my health was in, in pretty bad shape. I was completely disconnected from myself, trying to cope overloaded with the stress of the business. And I sort of hit a bit of a bit of a rock bottom and, um, and knew I needed some help. And I, I think that I admitted I had a problem and I, I needed some help. And I went to see a psychologist who uh, suggested I start looking into meditation. And um, I took a transcendental meditation course. Mm. And that was my entry into the meditation space. And then that opened up this whole other world of all these different practices that you can try and do to help manage your health. And that led me to the, the Wim Hof retreat and the ice baths and, and the movement world. So all these things opened up to me and I, I got better and healthier and happier uh, the more I did them. So, and I've been doing Incredible. them ever since. Yeah. And you're very passionate about it, which is amazing. What do you think looking back on that period of continuing to feel? So there's obviously an element of feeling of, cause I, I was in a situation in my life where I felt like I was sinking to rock bottom, but I wasn't using alcohol. I was actually using travel as my escapism. Right. But that was, that was uh, feeding and fueling my loneliness. Yeah. And, and it was almost like I, I, I couldn't really see it at the time, but I was, I was creating my own reality constantly. And what do you think it was for you looking back now that you had to hit rock bottom first you know it cost you a relationship it cost you so many things you know you were drinking heavily you weren't accepting things what was it you think that kept you going on that trajectory before it allowed you to turn around i think i just had no the uh being able to listen to my my higher power or my inner voice or my soul or my spirit it was, it was just so blocked. I, I just had a really hard time hearing my own intuition and I had a hard time expressing myself um, in an assertive, direct sort of way. So I, get, I had some passive aggressive tendencies and um, I just swept a lot of my stuff under a rug and it just built up to the point where eventually the rug it, it, there's too much stuff under there and it starts spilling out. So for me, it came in the form of, of a rock bottom because I just couldn't keep, I just couldn't keep hiding it all. And I just reached overload and saturation. So um, these days I'm much better at um, recognizing the patterns that uh, start to come up for me and knowing when I need to act or, or not act or take a step back. So it's all learning how to manage yourself and you don't get an instruction manual, you know, when you, when you arrive here, you've got to kind of figure it out and everybody's different. So it took me so long. I'm 38 now. It just took me so long to start to work out how I operate. <laughs> we don't get a manual. That's for sure. And when you think of what you said then just resonates so much that you, you, like there was so much disconnection from the heart, the soul, the trust, the intuition, the voice that, and we don't have practices in Western culture to nurture that aspect of ourselves. Absolutely. And, and it's hugely important. Like it's, it, it, it's the difference, I think, you know, in, in Absolutely. living a life of fulfillment and purpose to feeling lost, suppressed, you know? Absolutely. And, to give you another example of that, um, you know, after I'd started meditating for a while, I've moved out into the country now. I, you know, I, I ended up uh, getting divorced, uh, separated about three years ago, and I, I've retreated to the country to my little cabin in the woods um, to uh, to meditate and read and and um, con continue my own apprenticeship in movement, breathwork, and meditation. That's uh, this curriculum I'm designing myself for me. 
and I'm just learning and absorbing as much as I can. And I was sitting here in the first couple of weeks of, of moving here and I've got this beautiful rainforest just outside my, uh, my house and I felt like the trees were talking to me. And I, and I think my rational mind says, this is crazy. You're crazy. You're losing it. You are literally going crazy, losing your mind. That's your imagination. The trees aren't talking to you at all. But then I said, well, well, what's the worst that can happen? I've been listening to this rational brain and stuff hasn't been going so well. Let's just, let's just hear the trees out. What, you know, what have they got to say? And the trees told me, they said, you need to go and do ayahuasca in Costa Rica. I said, oh, that's crazy. You know, I, what, I'm going by myself to Costa Rica and do, do ayahuasca? Like, that's crazy. And um, I just met a, a girl at the time. And, you know, I was going through that, that process of um, when you've just come out of long-term marriage and you've, you've got children and stuff, you, you're a bit hesitant about a new relationship. And I met this new beautiful girl and I was going through that process of, oh, I don't know if I should open my heart to this person and trust in love again, or, you know, don't be silly. You've just come through a very difficult, you know, relationship breakdown and I don't want to go through that again. And, uh, and, um, off I went to Costa Rica to do the ayahuasca. I'm, I'm just going to listen to this voice. I'm just going to keep listening now because the other one wasn't doing me so great. So, so off I went and I had these three intentions that they gave me to work with, but the overriding message that came through for me in that experience was that uh, I'd met my, uh, you know, my twin flame or my, my, my soul lover in this, in this girl that I just met. And I, that seemed crazy that I would get visions of, and that was coming through in the ayahuasca experience? Yeah, it came through wow. in the ayahuasca experience. And there was this scene of me and her and we were up in the clouds, like making love in the clouds and our bodies were all intertwining. And I got to experience this euphoric, dreamy, lovemaking. Uh, we were the sky and we were in the clouds and it was just incredible, you know. And, and I, I just felt like I loved this woman. And I'm like, you've only known her for couple of weeks or something this is insane and um and i just i've just kept listening to that voice and kept trusting in that and and the more i'm doing that everything is just getting better and better and i've fallen in love and just found this amazing relationship that brings me warmth and strength and support and it's beautiful so amazing mate i'm so happy for you and, and I, I remember talking to you after that experience of because it was Rhythmia, right? You went to in Costa Rhythmia, Rica. Rhythmia, yeah. And, uh, and then you came back. I was like, you did what? You just got on an airplane, you flew out. And you, yeah. I mean, for most people right now, that would just sound crazy. Like we, you know, it's really interesting. We, we love the idea of doing these things, right? We just go, you know yeah. what? Fuck it. I'm just going to, you know, right? <laughs> but, the, but then there's, there's all these parts of us who start rationalizing. Oh, no, no. You know, like, like you said, what what is it or what do you think it is that gives you the courage to do that i think you need some evidence you need some proof mm. and and so you start with little things and then when you get a little bit of validation that the hunch or the voice was was on the money uh you start to trust it more and more so i think starting with smaller things um was 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 what I did. And, um, for example, you know, the decision to end a marriage is pretty massive. And you, especially when you've got small children and making those kind of changes, but then when it leads to something beautiful and, and your life transforms mm. in another way, you realize, Oh, that it was very painful and you, you can't quite comprehend or understand it at the time when you're going through a really difficult period. But when you're consciously making those decisions, um, because it's not healthy for you any longer or those things aren't serving either of you. Um, and then new things open and creation happens. You start to trust. So yeah. that's been it for me. Yeah. And beautiful mate. So well said. And you wasn't scared of going and drinking a vine in the middle of the jungle in Costa Rica. Cause hear me out. Right. I did, <laughs> I did ayahuasca back in 2013, I think it was. Yeah. Right? And I spent a year 
like absorbing YouTube videos, researching. I spent over a month preparing before I did it. I was so terrified. Yeah. But I had this calling like you. Yeah. And the day I went to go and drink the bloody stuff, my whole body was want, just wanting to shut down. I literally had to be carried up to drink this because I was so embodied in fear from wow. a previous experience as a child wow. related to psychedelics. Wow. But there was a part of me that I clung on to that knew this was the right thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> like and I was clinging on for dear life. Yeah. You know, so when I hear somebody like yourself going, oh, yeah, yeah, let's just, you know, let's, let's go. You know, yes. was there any elements of that trepidation or fear that, that came with that? You. I think uh, for sure I was I was terrified. I was absolutely petrified because I'd never done any uh, psychedelics before. I'd never done any hallucinogenics, so I was really and I, you know what I was most afraid of is that there was some creepy part of my past that I'd blocked out as a child, like you know something hugely traumatic had happened to me, and that was going to get revealed to me in the visions, and I was going to end up in some kind of psychosis afterwards. Um, what if the care wasn't good enough there? Or what if mm. I had a meltdown and I was on, I was traveling alone. How would I get back? I'm in a strange country. So all of those fears were there. And I chose Rhythmia because it's in a, it's not deep in the jungle. It's in a sort of a more of a westernized resort and they have, um, you know, doctors and nurses there that can help support you. So on arrival, they take your blood pressure and they, they, um, you can see all the, the medical equipment. And I think as a Westerner, that just started to put my mind at ease that I didn't have to worry about the safety aspects and I could mm. just focus on uh, the visionary experience. And I took the dieta and the preparation seriously and I, I, I went on the diet um, for a few weeks out to sort of went plant-based for a couple of weeks leading in just to sort of clean my vessel as much as I could, no coffee, no alcohol for a couple of weeks. And then when I arrived, I just was, I was fully committed to the experience and just was ready to just open up and allow whatever would come through. And, and that's exactly what happened. Amazing. Yeah. Good on you. So I just wanted to bring that in a little bit for people as well, because it is a big decision at the end of the day, but uh, I, I love the way you've been exploring. I'm going to rewind slightly because there's still a couple of loops in my brain that have been open because I love your transition. And I think there's so many lessons for everyone listening today to learn from, because I have no doubt we can all relate to different elements and parts in our lives of our own suffering or feeling stuck or trapped or big life decisions as well, you know? And what did it mean to you if you've hit rock bottom and you've, you seek some help and they've recommended transcendental meditation. Can you re even recall back in your journey, how that impacted you at that point coming in, coming out of that? Because again, even for many people, meditation can feel like such a foreign concept, a bit woo woo, a bit like, you know what? That's just, yeah. just for people in cabins up in the forests. You know? yeah, absolutely. And I think, uh, <laughs> yeah, I think, Transcendental meditation was a nice entry point for me because it's very simple. It's mantra based. Um, mm. So you just say one word over and over in your mind for 20 minutes. And the prescription is 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the afternoon or the evening. And I just needed a structure and something very basic. And the most woo woo part of it where I felt awkward and, um, a bit silly was I, I sought out a teacher and um, she was up in the hills and in, in uh, doing teaching from her home. And I, I arrived in this little house in Mullaney and um, she explained to me what it was and, and then that we would need to do a ceremony to give me my mantra. And uh, there was a photo of um, a guru on the, on the counter and there was some Hindi um, memorabilia and, and I, I had to bring uh, some food offering, a piece of apple or something and uh, a handkerchief and some flowers. And this is sort of like an offering to the, to the lineage and to the history and the tradition of it. And that was a bit icky for me. I'm like, oh, I don't want to be indoctrinated into a, a new religion. What is yeah, this? Some cult. 
<laughs> but she sang in some Sanskrit and, and I remember having this out of body moment thinking, Oh my gosh, you're such a loser, Aaron. You're standing here in some widow's house. They're singing a language you can't understand. You're holding flowers and a hanky, looking at a bearded man in a picture. This is another rock bottom moment. You're crazy. Um, but um, I got my mantra and I went home and I did it. And then even after a few days, I felt better. And oh, after a few weeks, I felt incredible and the, the heaviness just started to lift and I experienced some peace and it just felt like uh, the only other ways I'd experienced peace was maybe from surfing or something that those flow state moments of being completely out of my mind where I'm you know I'm surfing a big wave or I'm or I'm climbing a mountain or or I'm even playing rugby league or something that was super high adrenaline with high stakes. That was the only other moment where I felt uh, that relief. And so all of a sudden it gave me this new tool that I'd, I'd never had before. And I could feel peace whenever I wanted. And twice a day I got to feel peace and just take the weight of me off and just relax and not have to do anything or be anyone or, um, so it was tremendous. Yeah, how good is that? To feel to feel that in a moment, especially when there's a lot going on, it's special, isn't it? Absolutely. And, then, and like you say, if it then becomes into a window, well, if, if there's this, where else am I missing out on? You know, yes. and, and then that's where the fun begins, I think. You, um, you're, you're, you're very inspirational around the movement um, scene. Like I follow you on Instagram, mate, and, and every time I either laugh or I'm in awe, <laughs> what, you, what you do on your Instagram channel, and um, when when did movement inspired movement coming to to fit in with you from from that movement? Did it come not long after the transcendental meditation? Yeah, it was around the same time because um, I was taking care of my mind with the meditation, but I found that when I first gave up alcohol, uh, I made the decision. I, I, I was nearly in a car accident myself because I was being an idiot. And um, uh, this is when I'd, I was at the peak of my drinking and, and I nearly caused a really serious accident. It nearly hurt a lot of people. And I was so ashamed um, that I found myself in the, in the gutter beside the road one day crying on my own, having a little moment. And I, I got hit by that voice like a sledgehammer that you're not to drink anymore for a while. So I quit drinking and um, part of it was the meditation was really helping with the mental side of things, but I needed, I felt like I almost needed to distract myself a little bit um, from wanting to drink. So I filled in some of my time uh, with handstands and learning how to do handstands. So I've only been doing the handstand work for four or five years, the same time I've been meditating and um, all the other uh, health stuff. So that's how it started initially. And it just became a regular practice, just like meditation and breath work. I just started doing it daily and got hooked. And um, I found there's more freedom in that for my body. And I really enjoyed uh, the physicality of it. And again, you need sort of that harmony of, of the mind and the spirit and the body um, to really express yourself. And I love all the balance orientated uh, body weight movement work where you don't need anything. It's just you. Yeah. Yeah. So. There you go. And were there any, any people that inspired you in the movement space that you were aspiring to when you started looking at that? Because the, 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 the amount of skill level and training and, and, the things that need to be broken down to get to the things that you're actually doing. I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing. You know, I, I, I when it comes to movement, like I'm right down the bottom, and, like, <laughs> you know, I, I'm like, Oh, you know, I blame my height. I go, oh, I'm six foot four. I'm too tall to get into. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's not the case at all. It's just a cop out. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, Edo Portal was uh, a huge, uh, lightning bolt inspiration for me mm -hmm. around five years ago i saw a clip of him on youtube almost levitating the guy could uh, bend in every direction he could hold himself on one hand 
one arm handstands. He could uh, do these tricks and flips and, and yet he had nice muscles and he looked great. Uh, he seemed to have a philosophy that he carried with him. And so he's sort of the godfather of movement culture as it's become uh, known for now. So that, that was a really huge light bulb for me because I'd, I'd only ever known sort of gym bro or rugby style strength and conditioning, um, which wasn't really serving me any longer. Um, and I, and I uh, could really benefit from mobility and opening up and um, being a bit more limber and having some flexibility rather than only lifting weights. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah, yeah for sure. He was a huge one for me. Yeah, and so many people, so many yeah. people. I mean, it really, Edo Portal really started to come on the scene for me for, at the Wim Hof retreat because there, yeah. there were a few people there that had kind of gone through the ranks yes. been looking at that and uh, coming through. And Wim Hof, where, how did he come onto your radar? And how did you wind up? I never even asked you how you ended up at that retreat. Yeah, I think I was so um, motivated at that time to start exploring my health that I, I you know I saw something about one of his world records sitting in ice and that really caught my attention and I've just I've always loved Dutch people I've got some Dutch kind of relatives and they're so charming and charismatic and funny and I really I just dig their style and and so the fact that he was Dutch and that he had these cool world records and something just um, so attractive about that man uh, to me that I just wanted to be near him and, and I wanted, and I heard that he was doing a retreat in Melbourne in winter and it was sort of this challenge orientated four days in the cold and we're going to get in board shorts and get in ice, which I was terrified about. I'd never been in ice before. Or oh, even. hadn't you? That was no. your first time. Right. First yeah. time. And wow. so I, I did a bit of his breathing, you know, in the, in the sort of couple of weeks before that retreat to sort of know what to expect. And then I, I just got on a plane and went down and, you know, this is when I started listening to this voice that just says, you should do this. And then I just started doing it and I started meeting all these amazing people and learning all this new stuff and just feeling healthier and happier. So, and the breath work's just a, another tool that I've, I've been doing daily ever since, ever since that retreat. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. yeah, I do. I, I still, I always look back. I mean, I catch up with David O'Brien, you know, pretty much weekly, Mark Kluwer and, yeah, uh, Rodrigo is not far from me. All these amazing human beings that we all came together in this just unique, unique experience. And uh, and as amazing as the the Wim Hof experience was, it's it's the memories you come away with. It's the people. It's the bonds. It's the it's you go through these things and you have connections for life. You know? uh, hey, uh, do you remember that guy who was snoring? Do you remember that? Yes. Because. For the viewers, we were staying in like this school camp uh, set up on these bunk beds and and I was actually on the bottom bunk of, um, of that chap who... No way! Yeah, and he, when he snored, the whole bunk started rattling, you know, and <laughs> <laughs> it was unbelievable. I'd never heard a man snore that loud. And there'd be like 13 angry men um, <laughs> waking up, just staring at him, just going, oh my God. And the, if I, first, the first night was hell because I didn't sleep a wink and my ego was just so inflamed because it was like, I can't believe this. I'm here to do a health, you know, get my health in order. And I'm going backwards right now because of this guy snoring, you know? And then it was just this beautiful little micro kind of test within within the retreat about acceptance and and also compassion because um josh chatting to the guy he had some um yeah a heavy man and he had some apnea and stuff like that and it affected his relationships and once i started talking to him about it and understanding the sort of suffering it's caused him it, it just totally changed my view and the next night i went and slept out in the hall on some yoga mats so oh, i could wow. get some sleep yeah, it was incredible. And that's when we met Josh Coleman as well. I remember, you know, he was having a heart attack in the bed the next morning. Yeah. And uh, and then he got rushed to hospital. But then he had met Dave and Dave, he'd been working at Fifth Element after that. Yeah. And came through and then he came on the podcast uh, last year, which was incredible as well. You know, there's just so many wonderful things that, that come out of that. And uh, I think that's why I'm so passionate about retreats and why I do them in yes. my own work in 
bring in those like-minded relationships together because a typical retreat will attract a typical kind of person, you know, Absolutely. at the end of the day. And it's so important to have that it becomes and a co common conversation. Then. Yeah. And I think what I've learned from these workshops and retreats are that, and even surf trips to a point where I'll meet people that I don't know, it's almost as though you can connect and, um, combine in in a couple of days what you can do in years with people in the in the real world like you might have co-workers or friends of friends that you have locally but you don't develop the depth of connection that you do with someone in those environments in 24 hours or 48 hours and you can have these lifelong connections and it sort of transcends real time in a way because you're in this little this little bubble where you can just connect and and people are so open and honest and it's amazing, isn't it? And yeah, yeah. nobody cares like what you do for a living or where you're, yeah. where you're at. And like, like we, we, we're all here for a common reason. Yes. And that's, that's what you, unites you when you come together like that. And, uh, Absolutely. And that was one of the first ones I went on. And I couldn't believe people would just openly tell you why they're there and their problems straight up. And initially it was confronting for me to somebody to say, oh, look, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm suicidal at the moment because I'm, mm. I'm depressed. I'm addicted to drugs. I, I've just gone through a horrific divorce. I, I don't know where to turn and I'm here to try and get my life on track. And it's, whoa. And they, that's in the first sentence. Someone will, will tell you that. And, you know, it's, it's the trust that they give you and which is beautiful because it builds such a deep connection. And I'm still in touch with a lot of those people too. Mm. And within a few days, you've got this lifelong connection that you'll remember forever yeah yeah fantastic yeah that will that will live with live with me for the rest of my life <laughs> <laughs> and that's the other thing on, on these things i've witnessed someone else's miracle and um you uh, know yes. I, I know you've had tiger on your show and i was right next to him when when sort of he had his big awakening and um and i've seen at in the ayahuasca retreat i watched another man have a an incredible awakening um right in front of me and it affects you too you don't know what's going on in their mind or their visuals or what they're going through, but it's almost like that miracle spreads out and it, it touches you as well. And you can feel something going on, even though you don't know exactly what they're going through until they, they might share with you later. Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, what we found from doing it now all through last year and some of this year, um, I like giving yourself permission to heal and express that healing in whether it be verbally or, or physically or, or emotionally what you're doing gives other people permission to let go and heal as well. Yeah. So, so it's the, it's the strength of the community and the group that is the main healing aspect to it. That's what that we're seeing time and time again. Absolutely. Which is a beautiful thing. Yeah. Mate, I'm going to ask you a few questions. Um, okay. And we, I kind of touch on this one, but I always like to see what your, thoughts are because we have these low points in your life and do you look at them how do you look at them now and reflect upon them do you look at them as blessings are you thankful for them or do you see the wisdom in them like what, what are you how do you reflect upon these things all the biggest low points for me the biggest disasters so um you know the things being made redundant in the gfc the accident that happened um hitting rock bottom through alcohol they all have this butterfly effect where on the other side, they, they lead me to something so beautiful, uh, like my, my, new, my new relationship, which is just incredible, beyond anything I could have imagined was possible, uh, a relationship with a, with a woman um, or my health, the way I'm able to then push into the handstand stuff beyond what I thought was possible for me. Um, uh, and now I'm sort of looking at my own career and where I push that. And it all comes through th 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 those moments of suffering um, suck when they're happening. But now I have enough experience to know that they always lead to something beautiful. So as much as I hate them when they're happening and I still feel the pain and they suck and I get angry and cranky, I, I have a sort of a meta awareness now, like something, I know, okay, this is, this is going to be all right. This is going to turn into something. So I just, 
stay with that now and I'm grateful for them. Yeah, beautiful. What does your morning routine look like these days? Morning routine is I make a coffee. I love my coffee. I really try to not look at my phone. Uh, I go to the toilet. I get my coffee. I do my breath work. I do mm-hmm. three rounds of Wim Hof meditation. On After my- coffee? I do. I, I, I sort of like, I sort of like sip it in between rounds. <laughs> and I can't help it. And, uh, and then by the time I've finished my Wim Hof, I'm sort of halfway through my coffee and then I do 20 minutes of meditation and I just sit there and, and do my thing. I've got a notepad there. So if anything comes to me, I jot down some ideas that might come to me and then I'm ready to start my day. Um, yeah, I, I sometimes go for a walk or have some light movement, a little bit of a stretch. Uh, I'm getting, I'm in the sun, um, usually getting a little bit of sunlight Mm. and um, I hydrate, I have some water. So that's my morning. Amazing. How can you not have a great day after getting up like that? It's good. It feels good. And if I do have to skip it or I sleep in or I'm lazy or something, um, it's no big deal. I just, I just make sure I get back to it tomorrow. Yeah. Good on you. Yeah. Well, has there been a book that stands in your mind that's had a big impact in you during your life? I think the power of now by Eckhart Tolle oh. was uh, the light bulb for me. I can remember feeling something in my head move when I read that I, it was just timing. I think the right time to be, I picked it up and, um, I was unfamiliar with the concept of the witness. I didn't really know what that was. And I, you know, he speaks a lot about the witness and observing your thoughts. Mm. And it was the first time I'd, I'd experienced that. And I almost felt something shift inside my head. Um, so yeah, those books that give you like a physical brain shift. Um, I love, and that one for me was pivotal. Yeah. I reckon a lot of people, would say the same thing about that book, The Power of Now, that's for sure. Mate, um, the other question I wanted to ask you was, what's one thing about yourself most people wouldn't know? About myself that I wouldn't know? Oh, geez. That they wouldn't know. I'm such a sharer. I'm an oversharer. You know, I get criticized. <laughs> <laughs> Just stop sharing. Um, <laughs> Let's see that wouldn't know. It's hard because you can really unlock, unlock the closet there, can't you? There's uh, skeletons there that uh, you, you, you almost don't want to unearth. <laughs> um, oh, geez. I mean, the thing that's coming up to me um, was I, um, I, did, I don't know why this is coming to me, but I... I remember one time I, I was running to catch the bus. So I was kind of like a pretty good, good kid at school, like a good student. It didn't really get into trouble much or do too much wrong. And um, I was running to catch the bus. I was running late and uh, I ran through some puddles and through the, across the footpath and had to stop the bus. And I must have only been about 10 years old or 11 years old. And I got on and um, thanked the bus driver for stopping to get me. And then when I sat down, I had this horrendous smell I thought, what is that stench? And I looked down and I'd stood in dog shit. (laughs) (laughs) And I had this like dog turd stuck to my foot. And I thought, what am I going to do with this thing? I I was too embarrassed to say anything. Or do I stop the bus? What do I do? And I sort of like wiped it on the side of the bus on the inside railing. And then I just moved seats somewhere else. And uh, I just tried to keep it a big secret. And um, that afternoon when I caught the bus, the bus driver looked at me when I got on the bus and he had that look, you know, I knew he knew it was me. <laughs> uh, so I don't know why that came to me, but uh, you probably carried that guilt for a long time. <laughs> a lot of guilt. I feel better now. I've let it out. I've told everybody. Fantastic. Mate. And last question uh, with everything we've covered today, what would you like our listeners to leave our listeners to ponder on? to ponder on I think it would just be for me um, what was so helpful was to listen to that inner voice and and to and to not think you're crazy for having 
those ideas or that guidance that is there. So finding a practice that resonates for you, it doesn't have to be meditation or breath work or movement. It can be anything. Maybe it's music or writing or um, something creative and making time for that in your day um, and, and find that outlet that works for you and, and let that voice come through and pay attention and, and honor it by listening to it and actioning what it's telling you and just see what happens. Beautiful, mate. Beautiful. And people, I, I definitely encourage everyone to follow you on Instagram. That's where I see you most. Yes. What's, what's your Instagram handle? It's uh, at agriforama. So it's just agriforama for now. Um, yeah, so that's where everybody, everybody can find me. At the moment, yeah. And what, what, what's your plans for the future with all this, mate? Where are you taking it all? Well, I really want to share. I really want to share what I'm learning and uh, I want to help other people. So my calling is, is getting stronger and stronger to, to serve and to help other people um, get healthier and happier. So I am in the process of uh, a few projects, side projects for now. I'm still running the law firm mm -hmm. at the moment, but I really want to start to. Um, launch and release some more material that can help people. So I'm in the process of building a new website and creating some video materials and uh, some courses and uh, with my beautiful partner, Mel. So uh, we've, you know, we're sort of creating a brand at the moment and Brilliant, Brilliant. Um, it's sort of in the brainstorming development stage, but it's getting closer and closer to being able to release. So um, yeah, if you follow me, uh, you'll get some updates and, when it's ready to launch out, out into the world, it will go. Yeah, totally. Well, for everyone listening, if you pause this episode and scroll down, um, the link to Aaron's Instagram will be in the show notes below. So um, I highly recommend it because, like I said, I always get a chuckle and a bit of inspiration at the same time with what you're up to uh, on there, mate. So it's, <laughs> it's, it is awesome. And Aaron, I just want to thank you for your honesty, your openness for coming on the show today and sharing from the heart. Uh, I have no doubt you would have inspired many people uh, just from you being you, mate. And uh, I, I'm so excited for you and your future and, and can't wait to follow your progress and see where it goes. Thank you. And um, yeah, thanks for inspiring me, Guy, because uh, you were the one, I think, that planted the seed for the ayahuasca when I spoke to you uh, first at the Wim Hof retreat. And, oh, wow. and, um, and you were a real guide at that retreat for me you had experience with those things and I really I felt enormous trust in you um, at that retreat and with the work you're doing now I really look up to it and it's inspiring me to uh, do something similar and share what I'm passionate about and to keep honoring that voice so thank you for uh, being that person for me I appreciate it mate I appreciate it thanks Aaron that was awesome thank you